Cyberpunk 2077's latest expansion takes players to a shady new spy-filled location where you simply cannot trust anyone. Well, anyone except CD Projekt Red's quest director, Pavel Sasko, who was kind enough to guide us through the opening portion of Phantom Liberty and the new additions that have come to the game as a whole thanks to Update 2.0. So here's a few things that we found out. While Cyberpunk 2077 might present a less than ideal vision of humanity's future, CD Projekt Red themselves have arrived at Phantom Liberty's launch date full of optimism about what lies ahead. In fact, Pavel even admitted that this was the calmest he'd ever been for any game release. I've shipped a couple of games in mm. my life. It just always feels very special. And I think this one is probably the calmest I've ever been. <laughs> oh, wow. And since it's always good to know who you're talking to, Pavel was also kind enough to explain exactly what a quest director does. Oh, and anyone who just yelled out, oh, they direct the quests, obviously, just go sit in the corner. You're on a timeout. Your title is quest director. I think I have a pretty good idea of what that is, but what, what does a quest director actually do? Right, so... In uh, CD Projekt Red, as a quest director, I have three separate departments. This is a uh, quest team, uh, open world team, and cinematic team. Oh, wow. So those three departments are pretty much responsible for designing and implementing the story, the quests, the open world content in our games. Uh, together, we were like making sure the story of Phantom Liberty, the quests, the open world content kicks ass as much as it can. It kind of goes without saying, but Cyberpunk 2077 is simply one of the most stunningly beautiful games we have ever played. And Pavel also let us know about the extra effort that went into making the Xbox Series X and S versions especially sublime. Apparently, it was a major challenge to create a world that was so brimming with detail and atmosphere without things popping up, whilst also ensuring that the frame rates held to a smooth and steady 60 FPS, even when the screen was filled with enemies, explosions, laser beams, and dismembered body parts, which in Cyberpunk 2077 is actually a pretty regular occurrence. And Phantom Liberty presented all sorts of new challenges, like getting Idris Elba's famous frown just right. It's a look that strikes fear into the hearts of Baltimore gangsters and aeroplane hijackers everywhere, and it actually required CD Projekt Red to basically rework their entire facial animation system so that Idris's character, Solomon Reed, could pull it off too. Not many people know that, uh, but basically to just make him properly in the game, we really had to uh, like alter the rig of uh, faces of our characters because Idris has such a specific mimics and such a such a specific uh, specific way of just using his face. It was interesting because when I was talking to him, he was like mentioning that like you know one of his eyes acts differently than the other and so on. Oh, he wow. actually blinks. His blinking is slightly desynchronized. But what is probably <laughs> the most iconic, I would say, about Idris is his frown. You know, is the oh. frown that he has on his face. He's like the most recognized for him. And the thing was that our rig originally, like the one we have on our NPCs, couldn't do it, right? Because like we didn't have NPCs that required that. So we had to alter the rig of his face to be able to pull, pull this off. And uh, when I was talking to Idris, I told him about this and he was really laughing because, <laughs> you know, he obviously knows. <laughs> you know, how he uh, how he looks like, how he acts. And uh, it was really a tremendous difference when we put Idris in the game and we had all of those alterations already on the rig um, uh, of his face to really pull off his look. Um, and it was a work of our cinematic animators. Uh, David Cordero is the guy that I wanted the name of. Uh, I wanted to bring up uh, mm. our coordinator of cinematic animators. He was studying this guy's face to really make sure that Idris looks like Idris and really, really uh, makes a huge difference. Did he do that in person or was it from like reference photos? Because I imagine if it must take hours to just stare at someone's face, you probably want to use <laughs> probably want to use pictures and, and film. It was that. a lot of reference material, yeah. Yeah, a lot of video material, uh, you know, from various like movies and clips, but also from the mocap uh, that he recorded from us. So just, ah, you know, nice. all kinds of references. Of course, this wasn't the first time that CD Projekt Red had brought a Hollywood superstar into Night City. Keanu Reeves is already a beloved resident there thanks to his character, Johnny Silverhand. And both Johnny and Solomon feel like they were custom made for the actor. And Pavel also explained just how CD Projekt Red were able to tap into each actor's unique charms. 
I think there's two different schools of, you know, how do you cast actor for a role, you know? Like, one school is, I would say, the one that we used in case of Keanu Reeves. Mm. In case of Keanu, we sort of had a story written. We already knew what we want to do, and we were looking for an actor that would fit the best. Mm. And there, you know, Keanu, because of his past, because of the fact that he played in Johnny Mnemonic, in, in Matrix, all yeah. of those roles, we kind of, like, knew that, okay, he will fit, and he, of course, you know, agreed to play a role. And then from that point, on we knew that when uh, we are designing quests and and dialogues and scenes for him this is the actor we are writing for while in case with Idris it was slightly different yeah. because we have written down a story outline it was just a short I would say description of what the story is gonna be but that was it there was nothing more ah, okay. so when we meet Idris and we sort of like kicked it off with him and we explained him hey man like so this is the idea for your character this is the idea for the story but that's as much as we have right now he really liked it and then when designing quests and and you know and scenes and whatnot we already could actually design it for Idris you know, when I was talking with him, I actually told him that that it was so much better and easier to just design the scenes, knowing that he is there. He has this mm. very dominant presence yeah, in the scenes. 100%. And again, if you play Phantom Liberty, you will see it. Like a lot of reviewers, a lot of players pointed it out that he has a very dominant, like sort of a presence in those scenes mm. and that is of course not by accident that happened because we've designed it like this. when i was on gdc so game developers conference mm. in san francisco earlier um uh, this year uh when i was talking about actually designing the stories and and whatnot um in designing the choices and consequences we really had to pay attention to the fact that on one side you'll have idris or keanu on another side whoever you are choosing between i don't want to spoil anything mm. and we, we had to, you know, think about the fact that, you know, uh, Idris is going to actually make people really choose him. Yeah. And most likely people will fall for him much easier. I mentioned a couple of times that we had Keanu come over and record many lines for us, mm. for him here, because like we really wanted to make sure that both Idris Elba and Keanu Reeves in our game, they have an actual ambitious role to play that there is some story arc, some character development, and it's, it has depth, you know, that we are not only using, you know, those poster, I would say, uh, poster names, you know. Yeah, um, it's not just, just for the for face, it. it's for, it's exactly. for the, the it's not... portrayal that they can deliver as well, right? Exactly, it's for the performance, it's yeah. for the depth, it's for the emotions, Henry. Like, we as storytellers, we really want to make sure that you as a player, when you're playing our games, you're experiencing emotions, you are really interacting with deep characters, you know? And even if you're gonna get this, um, you know, um, uh, Johnny Silverhand is um, uh, in the game, uh, and Keanu Reeves playing that role, and then Solomon Reed and Idris Elba playing that role, you'll be moved, you know? Mm. There will be things that will actually touch you, you know? So this is all done for the for the art, you know? For this experience, right? Like, for you as a player to just feel things, you know? Cyberpunk 2077 is one of the best games out there for one of my favorite aspects of open worlds, quests and side quests. So since it's his forte, I asked Pavel, how is a great quest made? We normally start for something, it will sound a bit strange, but we start with something cool. <laughs> that we yeah, okay. do. Yeah. So we start from either from a character or you start from an idea for a scene or you start from uh, a specific dramaturgy or a choice or you start from specific aesthetics that you want to do. So there is something that actually is basically a seed, a beginning of this whole thing that you're building. And then from there, you're trying to sort of like naturally blossom it out. You know, there is this method um, that in Polish we call ponczkowanie, mm -hmm. which basically direct translation in English would be blossoming. It's like, I'm trying to get an idea and sort of naturally develop it from there towards like actually other, um, uh, other solutions and how you get there. And then, you know, as you are actually working on those, you are trying to delve deeper into those ideas, find connections between them, structure them. And then, of course, you know, you really need to use a lot of uh, storytelling knowledge, a lot of the storytelling, I would say, practices to put it all into good order and make it all work together. You know, mm. that's basically what we are doing. And um, 
it really takes a lot of time uh, to to, to uh, put it together properly. Like I always tell, you know, the the players, the media, when we are talking, that I mean, it's not that we are so good that anything we design is brilliant. It's just that we allow into our game only things that are good and brilliant. So we just end up designing like tons of things sometimes, but we just do not use a lot of it because like it's our responsibility as an artist, I would say, to just look into, you know, the content that we have designed and think about, okay, what will be uh, suitable for this piece of art uh, that we are making. And that's very much like the way how I'm approaching always uh, storytelling, quest design and whatnot, like I'm treating it as a piece of art. Mm -hmm. On average, how many how many different teams are involved in making a quest? Like whether it's a, oh. a story quest or whether it's a side quest? Yeah, it's a very interesting topic. So uh, uh, to answer this, I need to uh, mention first the Agile. So mm. Agile is a production methodology that we are using here in uh, CD Projekt Red. That was a big change after um, 2020 and release of Cyberpunk 2077. We have decided to change our production methods and go into Agile. And the way our Agile works is that you do have things that we call content teams. And content teams are basically a combination of people coming from uh, various different departments working together on achieving the same goal of building one content together and in case of let's say Delamain that was the case mm -hmm. you know you have a content team and in that content team you have let's say an, uh, an, a writer a quest designer an open world designer cinematic designer cinematic animator, oh my God. gameplay designer, VFX artist, audio designer, QA, you know, there's just so many people. It's roughly around like 20 something people that are wow. in one content team. And that content team, their job is to deliver given quest, given piece of content. You know, that is basically what they're supposed to do. So um, our, uh, my designers are basically members of the content team and they are, each one of them are working on certain pieces of code and making sure that they deliver it and they start working you know from the story perspective so they write a screenplay an actual screenplay for the quest and it sort of looks wow. like a something between like movie scenario and game design document that's the way you do it mm -hmm. and after we have it and this is normally written by writer quest designer and cinematic designer together so after we do have it then we normally start rolling it out to our artists let's say and our concept art team starts drawing they start drawing characters they start drawing locations you know mm. references and whatnot and then you know we start block outing it by level design team is like putting down the block out on the world uh, to make sure that we have it as cool as only possible Let's say you're new to Cyberpunk 2077, or you just felt like starting over. Well, you'll be happy to know that it's possible to jump straight into Phantom Liberty with a brand new character. Choose your background, customize your character's face, body type, and other bits, and then get ready to dive into Dogtown. The game will even automatically assign you a bunch of attribute points so that you can hold your own in this dangerous district, and you'll be free to redistribute them as you like later on. The one other thing that you need to select before playing is the difficulty setting. And while this might sound obvious, Pavel really wanted to emphasize that the very hard option is, in fact, very hard. And rest assured that CD Projekt Red are definitely watching you struggle with it. It really starts kicking off from hard and very hard. Like hard can be challenging, but when it comes to very hard, this is actually a proper challenge in this case you really need to use all kinds of gameplay features yep. that you have and so on you need to level up you need to take care of your gear to survive and i was watching a couple of streamers in the past few days and they were getting their ass handed to them <laughs> by the very hard because they jumped in expecting that this is gonna be simpler it wasn't no nope. <laughs> so. yeah Fortunately, you'll find that Normal provides a sturdy enough challenge for most players, while those who are just here for the story and the chance to slice up some dudes in half, you can just hit easy and relax. Update 2.0 also overhauls the way cyberware upgrades work, starting with a new UI that gives you an x-ray look at how all that futuristic tech fits inside a human body. It's fascinating, insightful, and deeply, deeply gross. Ugh. 
So here you go, like what happens basically Whoa. when you go to the first uh, Ripper Dock mm. in the game, you will be, of course, you know, you'll experience this like short tutorial sort of showing you what to do. And the whole thing, the whole deal here is about the fact that we have created this capacity system. So yeah. what it does, it basically shows you how much cyberware your body can take. And I honestly love it. Like, look at the right, you know, this, the way how the character is depicted in the moment mm. we will see, we will see the whole character, you know, uh, it's the work of uh, Robert Bielecki and his UI art team. Now, the guys put so oh, much emphasis sick. in making sure that you will really feel like this cyber human, uh, you know. Um, it gives and, you and a lot more you... context to like, quite how Absolutely. brutal some of these like modifications are because you know you might just think oh i'm just gonna put some gorilla arms i'm just gonna put you know uh right. sandavist in here and you think of, and you're like yeah done i'll just you know pop it in but this makes me see how intense it is to have like a smart link put inside my hand would be mm -hmm. it's like almost a bit gruesome like knowing yeah, that much detail yeah, yeah, so cool yeah. Exactly. It, it's a very interesting element of cyberpunk as a genre. It's the body horror, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. I would say Akira is probably like one of the most well-known examples of that. You know, like uh, those of you who know Akira, you know what I'm talking about. If you didn't see Akira, please go and watch it. You will do, uh, you will love it, um, uh, absolutely. But those elements, you know, of body horror that are very present for noir in cyberpunk as it is, it, you, you can feel it, you know, here in cyberpunk uh, 2077 as well you know all of those elements Amazing. now on the right side though you can see the whole armor system mm -hmm. so we have moved all the armor from the clothing to cyberware so right now right. you really can feel like this like cyber human almost like this fucking walking tank you know like this <laughs> machine almost and what's cool about it is that we have moved that armor from clothing so yeah. now as a player you can just wear whatever you you oh, want so you know good. like our players used to call it the clown meta. You know? <laughs> yes. the, the, yeah. The, the clown meta was that basically you were wearing like tank top with whatever um, you works. Know, yeah. With, with, with bra and, 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 you know, like short pants or like some <laughs> lingerie on you because that this is what basically had the highest armor. Yeah. Exactly. You can look the way you want, you know, style over substance and all that. Really important for cyberpunk. Uh, we really wanted to make sure the players can do that. So, yeah, anyway, just a quick glimpse like on our it. cyber system. Another clever bit of retooling that Pavel was pretty quick to point out is the change that Update 2.0 has made to Cyberpunk 2077's health system. Health items now work on a cooldown, so it's no longer possible to just save up like 30 of them like I used to and go barreling into battle without a care in the world. There's a real rhythm to each battle now as players are required to be a bit more tactical with their movements, retreating behind cover while they recuperate rather than just standing out in the open spamming max docs. As you can see, we have also redone oh completely goodness. the way how we approach the health. And right now you just cannot spam those boosters anymore, mm -hmm. right? Because before like people were just like jumping into combat, combat <laughs> and like popping that uh, boosters like Tic Tacs, you yeah, know, just I remember one I had, after like, another. I would have like 30 of the max docs going and it would just, yeah. I could just be unstoppable. And yeah, you're right. All right, I think let's run Yeah, we here. really didn't want to make it feel like this. So that was like the intention behind this change to make you be a bit more strategic and in the same time, just appreciate the rhythm of the combat a bit more, you know? Um, because like when you can be overpowered so easily, you sort of are not forced to use all of those tools and whatnot. So um, it's really it's really cool to actually be able to uh, just have that specific rhythm of like, okay, now I heal, now I shoot, now I mm. slash someone, now I hide, you know, and so on. Um, it just brings so much more depth into the combat, you know, it's not trivialized. Although even once you have acclimatized to the new system, sometimes you still just have to take the L. Nah. And also like this encounter has like oh. three separate levels. So in here it's, um, you know, uh, uh, no. Jacek Matuszewski and all his team. Oh, uh, I took a huge, okay. I, I tried to double jump to the next platform and totally busted my ankle. When you're not hiding in a corner, desperately waiting for a chance to heal, you'll find that Cyberpunk 2077's combat has also been given a serious tune-up. 
The gunplay is notably slicker, with a nicely balanced aim assist that makes it easy enough for newcomers to pick up and play, while more seasoned shooters are going to have a blast picking their enemies off with absolute precision. And of course, it all feels that much more immersive thanks to that first-person perspective, which Pavel revealed is actually something the team have been tinkering with since their witching days. I did work on The Witcher 3, I did work mm. on The Witcher 2 before, and I love Witcher, but seriously, like, na narrative, narrative and, and, and just the... Uh, uh, scene system in first person for Cyberpunk 2077. I absolutely love it. Mm. I, again, I'm I'm incredibly biased here because I am the one that actually have designed the first person perspective uh, scene system that we're watching. Oh, nice. Like I was building very early prototypes in 2016 based on old Witcher 3 tech. Can you believe wow. it? It was like <laughs> old Witcher 3 tech that I have hacked together. We've got a couple other programmers, designers. We have hacked out of it and built on that <laughs> i have built like a very early prototypes of the first person perspective um uh, seeing that uh, scene system that you're seeing right now and again of course you know the, the prototype was much rougher you know this one is of course much smoother we have learned so many more things you know from cyberpunk 2077 to the expansion mm. and yet there's the stance stance moment right because we need to get a tracker out from her neck but even if you're a regular sharpshooter, don't expect the bad guys to go down without a fight. The enemy AI is now a whole lot sharper, and they'll work together to flank you, push you into corners, and generally just try to become an enormous pain to your cybernetically altered butt. If you're playing as a netrunner, you might try and even the odds by hacking into nearby turrets to thin out the crowd. And while this is a great option, you'll find that many of your hacks are now traceable. And the enemy is pretty adept at using that to track you down and put an abrupt bullet riddled end to your computer time. I love the katana. Yeah, you can bounce the bullets off back to them, right? Like. Exactly. Let's take oh, that. yeah, doing some net running as well. And you have taken over oh. uh, of the because you have just you, you have applied the, the the takeover hack right so you have taken over the um, the turret just a moment ago so you could shoot them it's the one there in the car in front of you so yeah trying to get back control of it I think I got shot out of it oh yes it could be it could be actually that the enemies figure out where you are um, as a player controlling it so. Ah, so it's good to try and stealth to try and grab that turret because then they don't figure out your location. They can't push you off yes, the hack. Yes, yes, or just stay hidden, exactly, and nice. then you can just mow them down. But because you have, like, jumped in with your motorcycle inside <laughs> the whole encounter. Yeah, a little bit well, obvious. Then, um, the new AI makes combat a much more dynamic affair, and you even get to take advantage of it at times, like when the president's collection of shiny white robo bodyguards come to fight alongside you. Even with Pavel's expert advice, there is still so much new to see in Cyberpunk 2077 that you'll really just have to check it out for yourself. Let us know what you get up to down in the comments, and don't forget to like and subscribe. Bye, Tooms.